eh, presidente of CFA Society Chile. Thanks to CFA Society Chile member for connecting to this virtual conference. Also, a global passport program of CFA allow us to share this uh, live seminar to CFA charter holders and members in San Francisco and Spain. For us, keeping our members aware about market trends and best standards in investment is key in our strategic plan to add value to you. Before going deep into today's event, I would like to thank you, our sponsors, FINSA, Moneda Asset Management, Scotiabank, Sartor, and Janus Henderson. The market and geopolitical environment are challenging today, and having experts in the field is great for our profession. Today, the title of the conversation is Inflation Forecasting Model, Policy, Divergence, and Geopolitical Risk. Today, we have two experts in the field. Kian O'Brien, Senior Investment Officer at Colchester Global Investor. He managed, develop and emerging market bond portfolios and conduct sovereign balance sheet research at the firm. Sian graduated from the University College Cork with a degree in Commerce and German. He obtained a Master in Investment and Treasury for Dublin City University. He is a CFA Charter Holder and member of the CFA Society UK. Joanna David, David is Investor Officer with Colchester Global Investor. Uh, her role is multifaceted involving research, data management, processing, and analysis. Joanna graduated from the London School of Economics with a Bachelor in Economics, and she completed a master degree at the School of Oriental and African Studies, gaining a master in Middle East politics. Both of them are part of Coastal Colchester Investment Team, a global asset manager based in London, especially in fixed, in fixed income, who has a 60 billion under management. With an interesting value oriented philosophy focused in analysis of macroeconomic and fundamental variables. Joanna and Kian will present for approximately 40 minutes. After that, we will leave the opportunity to ask 10 questions to them. You can send your question using the, uh, the Zoom chat. Please keep uh, turn off your microphone during the presentation. Please, Kian and Joanna. Go ahead with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us. And uh, thank you to the CFA for organizing this event. So today we're going to go through three main areas with you. First, I'm going to give you an insight into our inflation forecasting framework here at Colchester. Second, I'll give you an outline of our current global outlook. And then I'll pass on to my colleague, Kian who will touch on the specific implications of the current uh, conflict uh, between Russia and Ukraine. So um, moving on, Kian, if you wouldn't mind. So looking at our investment philosophy, I'm not going to delve into our investment process here, but what I would like to highlight is that Colchester is a value-oriented fixed income manager. And on the bond side, the way we look at value, our main measure of valuation is the real yield. Now, I appreciate many people have different variations of what the real yield means to them, but for us, that means taking the 10-year nominal yield in any given market that we look at, and we deduct our own internally generated inflation forecast. Now, on this next slide, I'll give you a simple illustration of how inflation drives our in real yield approach. So if we look at two similar yielding markets, such as Singapore and the US, nominal yields of 2.3 and 2.4 respectively. I appreciate over the last week that has moved even further, but for illustration purposes, here we are. So 2.3, 2.4 nominal yield levels in Singapore and the US is our starting point. And then we have an inflation forecast of 1.5 for Singapore, but significantly higher at 4% for the US. Now, what that means for us is that the result of a 0.8 positive real yield in Singapore is deemed much more attractive relative to a very negative real yield of minus 1.6 in the US. So that's just to give you a bit of a flavor of why we look at inflation. And in fact, 
I would highlight here that a lot of managers, um, a lot of our peers in this space actually look to call a lot of market variables. They look to call interest rates, central bank policy activity and so forth. But at Colchester, we consciously look to limit our forecasts simply to inflation and ignore everything else. So I guess the next question begs, how do we do that? Kian, on to the next slide. So as you can see here, this is a little bit um, of our framework that I will go into. So Colchester has a very well-established framework in inflation forecasting, and that framework is steeped in the monetarist view in that money supply and credit growth is one of the key determinants of inflation over time. The essence of the monetarist tradition is such that, you know, should a government create too much money in an economy relative to its productive capacity, then over time that would lead to upward price pressures. Having said that, as you can see from the page, there are a number of other factors that we also do take into account, that being the changes in the prices of commodities, exchange rates, as well as capacity utilization. Now, capacity utilization, for the most part, can be proxied by thinking about the unemployment rate. So looking at our framework, there's a couple of points that I would stress at this, as, at, at this point. Firstly, when looking at the factors that we take into account at any point in time, we use the same framework across all the countries that we look at at any certain point in time. And the reason for that is this essentially acts as a baseline that allows for cross-country cross -country comparisons, apologies. And secondly, whilst I would say that perhaps most market participants are perhaps rather sh uh, more short-term in their outlook in terms, of, um, uh, in terms of their forecast horizons, we at Colchester feel that the sweet spot for our forecast horizons are actually 18 to 24 months. We feel that that's not too short, that you don't get much added value beyond the current rate of inflation, and it's not too far in the future that it starts to get deemed, um, uh, as, what's the word I'm looking, inaccurate, that's the word, sorry. So um, if we move on to the next slide, this is just giving you a flavor of a typical output of our modeling exercise. The case at hand here is a single variable um, output where we're looking simply at the money supply. And essentially what we do is we run regressions across different points of time in history. And we also lag the input variables that I've mentioned for different periods, be it three months, six months, nine months, et cetera. And we can run these regressions at a, on a single variable at a time, or we can do it as a multivariable regression. And essentially what comes out of this is, as you can see in the, in the blue, is what can be deemed a sort of a fan chart of potential inflation outcomes over our forecast horizon. Now, I would add that this is, this is simply the quantitative output of our inflation model. It's at this point in time that each and every one of us as country analysts will come in and supplement this output with our qualitative assessment of a country and end up with a single inflation forecast of what we deem likely over the next 18 to 24 month period. Now, <clears throat> we've just added a few charts and I'm just gonna showcase a very brief example using Poland. So as you can see from the first chart, what we've done is we, this is the actual CPI output of Poland over time up to the end of 2021. And what you can see is there is a somewhat level of correlation between the lagged, three-year lagged money supply along with inflation. However, that's not the whole story. As I mentioned, that's not the only factor that we take into account. If we go to the next chart, what we see is that whilst Poland had a very significant negative downturn in its capacity utilization there in the gray, gray line, which was in, in, at the time of the COVID pandemic. In fact, if you look at this across most countries that have the same sort of um, trend. However, what is noticeable for Poland is that the reverse upwards was very swift and very strong and it coincided at a time that unemployment was continuing its trend lower. 
So these factors are providing Im impetus for higher inflation in Poland. Now, moving on to the level of the exchange rate, as we can see in the gray line, um, Euro's lotti, uh, which is trending higher over time, is showcasing that Poland, the Polish lotti, apologies, Polish lotti has been trending weaker over the last few years as well. Now, lastly, if I just add on the commodities, I'm sure we're not all surprised to see that the significant leg higher in commodities that began at the end of last year, all of, all of which I'm trying to showcase a picture where all of these factors are providing a sort of a impetus for higher inflation in Poland. Now, taking all of this together with a discussion around Poland's sensitivity to commodity imports, you know, the existing structural problems that Poland has had in trying to fill the labor supply gaps that it's had, along with the general economic um, environment that it's in, we found that forecasting inflation for Poland over the next two years would significantly exceed its pre-pandemic levels of sub 2% to average around 4.4% over the next two years. So that's just giving a little bit into how we look at inflation and inflation forecasting. Now we'd like to move on to our current um, global outlook. So as we're all aware, inflationary pressures have been persistent across the world. However, there has been, and from what we see, there continues to be significant divergences across countries. And this is particularly not noticeable between Asia and the rest of the world. As countries started to emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic, supply bottlenecks started to emerge. And as restrictions started to subside, those supply issues started to get even more aggravated by demand side pressures. Indeed, it was the very strong fiscal and monetary support that we had seen across the globe that provided that underpinning that buoyant private sector demand that we have seen take place over the past year. Following on from this, we started to see some economies struggling with some very tight labor markets. And it was soon apparent to us that the transitory narrative that we were hearing from central banks across the developed as well as the emerging market economies was no longer the case. And in fact, for us, what we're seeing is the start of a prolonged period of a higher rate of inflation. Now, if we consider <clears throat> changes in the level of money supply over on the next chart, there are two main points that I would like to highlight from these charts. The first of which is that there's been a notable difference in the level of money supply growth across countries. As you can see from this chart, the US has been a clear outlier in the developed market space and Brazil within the emerging markets. Now, the second point I'd like to highlight is that while for the most part, the growth in the level of money supply had pretty much receded to pre-pandemic -pand pre levels, that's not the case for a number of countries. As you can see, the US, the UK, and arguably Indonesia are still sitting at somewhat elevated levels. Now, what this has translated to is a divergence in the trends of inflation that we see today. Now, if we look towards the next slide, please. The likes of the US and the UK are leading the way in, in, in inflationary trends within the developed markets. However, it is notable here that the likes of China and Japan, and in fact, the rest of the Asia region are not seeing the same inflationary pressures. Now, I could just revert back to the previous slide. And as you can see from that red China line and Japan, the monetary impetus was not really present in Asia as a whole, just using these two as a, a, a illustrative example. But also Asia in general is at a different point in the business cycle where productivity is still rising. And in that respect, price pressures are more easily absorbed. So going back to this page, as we see inflation is diverging across countries, both within the developed and within the EM space, 
And even within EM, whilst the Latin American countries, as well as the Central and Eastern European region are facing the brunt of those inflationary pressures, the likes of South Africa, we haven't seen take part in that trend and nor do we see it being a risk in the near future. So as I mentioned, like we've just looked at the money supply and the sort of the sort of link we've seen with inflation from there. However, like I've mentioned, it's not just about money supply. So if we look at the breakdown of using the US as an example, looking at the breakdown of poor CPI between the goods and the services component, as we can see from the graph, the goods component was very much when we started to come out from the restrictions placed on the amidst the COVID pandemic, you know, changes in consumer behavior started to really drive that um, the goods component uh, inflation higher. But we're now starting to see a significant shift in, in the services inflation. And as you can see, it's actually trending towards even higher than its recent, recent being over two decades of um, historical levels. It's trending higher than its recent um, levels. Now, the main rationale that we award to this is the fact that labor markets, as we've seen, are generally quite sticky um, across, um, across certain countries. Now, just before I go into this, one thing I would point from the previous chart as well, sorry, that I forgot to mention, was that the, the, the worrying aspect about this trend higher in the services component is that this is the element of inflation that tends to be stickier and more longer lasting which is what gives us more caution when we look to revise our inflation forecasts for the next two years. So going back to the element of the um, sticky labor markets, again, I've used the US as an example here. However, as I've mentioned, we've seen this trend play out in a number of countries from the UK to New Zealand and across the Central and Eastern European countries where the unemployment rate as a, is at recent historical lows, but as well the quits rate, which is the number of people choosing to leave the workforce, is at recent historical highs. Now, there's a number of reasons for this. Predominantly, we feel that, you know, the pandemic and the, the, the way that the, the virus um, sort of played out, you know, had a had a very significant impact on people's behavior, but also the level of fiscal support that was given out to people, but also the money, monetary support that underpinned higher asset prices globally, gave people that comfort to make the decision to either take early retirement or in fact to take just a different path. Now, whether we start to see that reverse course in the near future, we've yet to see that play out. So, <clears throat> moving on to the um, moving on to the next slide, and before I hand over to my colleague um, Kian to touch upon the implications of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, I'd just like to conclude by saying that the growth recovery in 2021 has been very strong, but largely uneven across countries. Now, the reaction function that each government took is going to play a large part in the pace and the viability of that recovery. Tight labor markets across the likes of the US, the UK, and most of the Central and Eastern European region is causing a risk of de-anchoring inflation expectations. Whilst on a positive note, most of the emerging market central banks had taken a very proactive approach to this and have been for the most part quite successful in keeping a tab on those inflation expectations. The global picture for us is far from uniform at this juncture. And it's those divergences that are only going to get accentuated right now by the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And um, I'll pass on to my colleague Kian to elaborate further on that. Thank you very much, Joe. And good morning to everybody. As Joe has said, thank you for, for being here. And really what, what I wanted to do was just add a little bit to what Joanna has said about the outlook for global inflation. 
taking account of the unfortunate events in Ukraine in recent weeks. So as everyone is very familiar, both Russia and Ukraine are sizable commodity exporters. So the direct impact of the current conflict on commodity prices and on inflation is likely to be very significant. And so any forecast needs to consider exactly what has happened in the past few weeks and the implications for commodity prices in particular. But maybe just to take a quick high level overview of how developments and the conflict in Ukraine can impact on financial markets. So we think there are, there are a few different channels. Clearly, as I've mentioned, higher commodity prices is a significant one in terms of the inflation outlook. But there are also possible negative pressures on global activity, both through investor sentiment and confidence and the implications thereof on investment, and similarly for, for global trade and ultimately global growth. So whilst you clearly have upward pressure on prices, you potentially also have some negative impact on, on real activity. And the interplay of all of these forces is going to be, or, or could be particularly damaging for the global economy going forward and something that we need to watch quite closely in terms of inflation forecasting. And it also creates significant divergences across different economies. And this is one of the themes of our inflation forecasting work for some time, that the global picture is far from homogenous. And what's happening in recent weeks can, again, have a significant divergent impact on different economies and different regions. And just to give a brief example, clearly in the region that you're in, in Latin America, the impact is going to be very different from what it is in, let's say, Central Europe. Not least because as commodity exporting economies, many of the Latin American economies are experiencing a boost in their terms of trade. So our analysis would suggest that Colombia and Brazil in particular, their external balance sheets are likely to benefit from the relative change in prices that we're observing. In Asia, some economies like Malaysia, for example, are relatively well placed, whereas Central Europe, unfortunately, as well as being geographically close to the conflict and exposed to heightened geopolitical risk. They are also significant importers of commodities. And so their terms of trade is being negatively impacted. So very briefly, you will no doubt have seen many headlines and many stories in the media about the importance of both Russia and Ukraine in global commodity markets. But just to give you some sense, Russia is, as you can see here, a significant percentage of global exports across not just oil and gas, but also wheat, palladium, platinum. So a significant impact on, or potential impact on a range of commodity prices and therefore on inflation. And of course, Ukraine, again, as everybody knows very well, another significant exporter of wheat, and in particular to countries in, in North Africa, the Middle East and Asia, where the reliance on exported wheat from Ukraine is relatively high. There is a, a material risk, therefore, of, of a knock-on impact on inflation, if not also on, on wider economic activity. I won't dwell on the two charts. Everyone knows, I think, at this stage, what's happened in recent weeks in terms of commodity prices. So we're seeing new highs in a number of commodities across both energy and food. 
perhaps a, an important point to make in terms of the inflationary impact, of course, is that the weight of food tends to be larger in emerging markets or in lower income economies in general. So the pass through from higher food prices, all else being equal, will be higher in poorer countries than it is in higher income countries. But as Joe has mentioned, the exchange rate is an important contributor to our inflation forecast. And in the context of what's happened in the past few weeks, we've seen notable divergence in exchange rates driven by the differing commodity exposure of various economies, such that the Brazilian real, for example, has rallied very significantly year to date, whilst currencies in Central Europe, like the Polish zloty or the Hungarian forint, have weakened quite sharply. And those exchange rate changes, of course, can either mitigate or accelerate the inflationary impact of changing commodity prices. And just to give you one example of the type of analysis that we look to do, if you take Brazil as one example, in fact, not surprisingly, it's food prices or commodity prices in local currency terms that matters for domestic inflation. So the gray line here is a measure of commodity prices, year over year price changes in Brazilian real. And then the blue line obviously is Brazilian inflation. And what you can see in recent months is that even as the global dollar price of commodities has soared, the strengthening of the Brazilian real against the dollar has offset or mitigated that upward inflationary impact, if you like. And therefore, looking at the relationship between domestic inflation in Brazil and food prices, you'd actually expect, all else being equal, that Brazilian inflation is, is close to turning over and coming back down. And that backdrop fits with our inflation forecasts derived through the rest of the framework that Joanna has described, looking at money supply growth, for example, we can see not just in Brazil, but in a range of economies that the likely future inflation rate is materially below the current rate. We are expecting inflation in many economies to remain above the pre-pandemic norm. But in a lot of emerging markets in particular, we think that, or we forecast that inflation will, will come down compared to its current level quite meaningfully. Partly because of the tightening in monetary policy that we've seen in economies like Brazil, the normalization of money supply growth, along with the changes in the exchange rate that we've just mentioned. So really, I want to draw to a close here and leave plenty of time for, for a Q&A for questions, but perhaps just to summarize our global outlook in many economies, we are forecasting higher, materially higher inflation, I would say, than pre-pandemic. So using the US as an example, where many of the factors that we look at are pointing in the same direction towards higher inflation. We have a forecast of around 4%. In other words, materially higher than the pre-pandemic norm, which was more like 1.8, 1.9 for US CPI, but of course lower than the current levels that we're seeing. That's a similar story across New Zealand, across Central Europe, across a lot of, of Western economies. High inflation today will come down, but remain above the pre-pandemic levels. Somewhat different story in Asia. Again, as Joanna has already alluded to, the business cycle in Asia, a lot of those inflationary pressures we're seeing elsewhere, not as relevant in Asia. So our forecasts are typically for inflation to remain subdued. And then lastly, perhaps just to mention the, the Latin American region, there has been, in our view, significant structural change 
over recent decades in terms of the credibility of monetary policy. And we've seen in the past 12 months a very orthodox and a very aggressive response of policy to higher inflation. So we think looking forward, based on the indicators that we look at, we think inflation is likely to, to reverse. It's likely to be meaningfully lower over our time horizon than the current levels. Although you might not see central bank targets being achieved within that two year time horizon. Nonetheless, we do think inflation rates will be materially lower than the current levels that we're seeing. So with that, I will just pause, hand it back to Hugo and open it up to questions and answers. Thank you very much, Joanna and Kian. Uh, we have several questions here. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity to go deep in some of the points that you mentioned. The first of them is how to add geopolitical risk into traditional quantitative models. And also, uh, uh, we have seen a trend, especially in emerging market, about controlling uh, prices. Uh, how do you consider that in, in, in your models too? They are, they are different questions, but I, I put it together. Sure. Okay, well, perhaps I'll, I'll pick that one up to start with, and then Joanna, do, uh, do add any further comments you, you might have. I think it's important to set the context or the framework to our inflation forecasting that we think it's very important to use a consistent model across each economy. Because ultimately, in any particular country, you can certainly enhance the accuracy of your inflation forecasting by incorporating more variables. So purely from a mathematical perspective, the more variables you add to your model, the better accuracy you're, you're likely to achieve. But not necessarily accuracy in terms of the relativities between different economies. So we like to maintain a relatively small number of explanatory variables, variables that we can apply consistently across every economy. So factors like geopolitical risk, whilst clearly they can have an impact and you can debate their impact on, on the oil price or the gas price or food prices. Ultimately, it's not something that we look to incorporate in that quantitative framework. We do include commodity prices. So to the extent that geopolitical risk will impact on commodity prices, that will be captured to some extent. But then we have a secondary qualitative element to our forecasting, which is where we take that output from the quantitative model and the quantitative analysis, and we do look to adjust it based on a qualitative assessment of country-specific factors. And here you could incorporate some element of, of geopolitical risk or uncertainty, but I would say that Typically, it's, it's not something that we look to incorporate simply because it's, it's so difficult to define and to model. Ultimately, we want to keep our framework as, as unbiased and as, as systematic as possible. And we think by using a small number of variables, money supply, commodity prices, exchange rates, capacity utilization, and that framework is, is sufficient in, shall we say, most economies most of the time. Then very simply on the second point on, on price controls, again, this is an element that we don't look to build into our modeling, but that we can take account of in that secondary qualitative analysis of individual countries. In general, of course, from, from an economic point of view, 
price controls are are generally frowned upon, shall we say, by economists and generally don't tend to be successful. But nonetheless, they are something that we would consider in that qualitative assessment of, of, a, of a country's um, inflation outlook, but not something we build into the model. Great. I don't know, Joanna, if you want to add something else? I'd just like to add here, I think it's just important to stress that in using the, the same framework across countries, really what we're trying to get is the relativities. We're looking for relative trends in inflation as opposed to absolute numbers within each. So yes, uh, you know, as Kian mentioned, there are nuances within each country that we try to take into account when we look at the qualitative aspects. But the rationale for trying to keep a, a, a framework as simple and clean as possible across um, the spectrum of countries is really trying to gauge the relativities of inflation. Okay, great, great. Well, we have another question here says like um, some, some economists and scientists call, call for the end of the globalization as we have seen during the latest decades. Which implication you can consider about that in growth, inflation, and financial stability? Okay. That's an interesting question. <laughs> I think, again, if I pick it up and, and pass it on to Joe, one, one point I would make on inflation in particular is that certainly the trend of globalization for the past few decades has largely been disinflationary. So if you think yeah. about the emergence of the Chinese economy and the huge increase in, in, in the global supply side, that has largely been a disinflationary force. If we are moving into some reversal of that globalization, then it's likely to impact inflation to the upside, I would suggest, to the extent that supply chains have been optimized for maximum efficiency, if you like. And that's how the global, the globalization trend, if you like, continued, a focus on efficiency above all else. If post-COVID, post some of the recent geopolitical tensions, if we see more of a focus on supply chain resilience, in other words, bringing activities closer to home, onshoring, whatever you call it, you're likely to be shifting activities from the lowest cost region to a somewhat higher cost region. So ultimately, I think there is a potential inflationary impact there, all else being equal. I don't know if it's going to happen quickly enough or have a large enough impact to significantly change the inflation outlook in let's say the next 18 months but i think as a global <laughs> factor you have probably seen seen the end of of globalization as a disinflationary force that that's the very big picture um mm. i'll stop there joe and, and hand it over to you no i mean i would agree with you we have discussed this and it is a you know, I guess from our framework, it, our starting point would be inflation, and I would um, allude to everything Kian has mentioned. And, you know, to some extent, we started to see that play out with the vaccination programs across the world. And, you know, it's it's already been, I guess, the biggest thing we, we've we already started to see deglobalization within security uh, products, so to speak. And now we're seeing Europe with the you know, the push for the renewable energies and sort of more security in their, in their supply chains within that realm. And so, I mean, what I think what that within our discussions thus far, and obviously we need more time with this playing out, but, you know, the divergences are becoming stark, you know, for us as relative value managers, that's, that's providing us opportunity. But, you know, I, 
just from the simple play out of what we saw with the pandemic and the vaccines and you know how the recovery has been for those countries with higher vaccination rates and and so forth you know it's pretty clear that yes inflation will generally be trending higher um and you know at the at the beginning we we struggled to see how you know one pandemic brought away sort mm -hmm. of the number of years of globalization and disinflationary trends, but you know, I guess part of that has been this this deglobalization type of uh, scenario playing out, but more so in the security type products so far. So so far, um, yeah. So You're okay. More divergence, I guess, is the conclusion I'm trying to say here. Um, difficult times mm. yes I, I, we had several questions about your specific about your models yeah uh, they take in consideration uh, how often do you change the main parameters of your model also mm -hmm. concerns about how often you refresh the the data frequency in your models and which time horizon do you project inflation today and you are confident that you are going uh, a, a good uh, estimator? So in terms of the forecast horizon, I believe you're asking on the last question, our forecast horizon is sort of to a two year period, 18 months to 24 months is how far out we look in terms of our forecast horizon. Um, sorry, the second part of that question was about the accuracy, did you say? Yeah, yeah, the second part was related to, to today we have a lot of noises mm. and uh, you have to be confident with that time horizon. So what do you do? Do you put longer your time horizon, your estimator, you are using more, uh, the data frequency is different or you are looking for alternative that data or information? No, so our forecast horizon is always set sort of the 18 to 24 month period. We, I mean, if we talk about a rigid framework, we revise our forecasts every three months. Um, of course, when we have significant moves in exchange rates or commodity prices, then that we would look at that more frequently. We would try to look at um, explanatory power of lag variables if there was such a significant magnitude of money supply or commodity prices or so forth that would warrant a significant revision. I guess in terms of accuracy, um, Kian, I, I don't know if you've understood the question different to me, but we do compare our forecast horizon to the likes of the OECD and the IMF because they're the only institutions who tend to have a similar framework and mindset to we, as we do, um, and horizon. Um, so that's not to say, you know, we would change ours if theirs were different, but we would cross check to some extent to see if there was something that perhaps we may have been missing. Um, in terms of your data frequency question, we are, we are looking at monthly data and that doesn't change with, um, with anything going on or anything in the markets or anything. We take monthly data and essentially when it comes to looking at something like money supply, what we do is we lag that money supply three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, um, even further, and look at that at different periods of history to see the strength of its explanatory power on inflation at those different points. And we will choose those different points the same as for all the countries to be able to try to get. Now, Obviously, sometimes when you're looking at a quantitative model, you can see when the expansion power may not be as strong for one market versus another. And that's when all the other factors come into play. And, and it's, you know, it's, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's part art, part science. Um, 
the variables that you stress at each point in time very much depend on what's going on. Uh, like, for instance, at the moment, uh, commodities is a big factor. Uh, six months ago, labor supply capacity utilization was a big factor. Uh, at the onset of the pandemic, you know, we did have the shock lower in oil prices. So in terms of the single or multivariable regressions that I spoke about in the model, I mean, that does depend very much on uh, the market forces at play. We strictly look at uh, monthly data. Uh, we have the same lags for those input variables um, for all countries. Uh, and we just, um, as I mentioned, so it's, it's somewhat art, somewhat science in terms of the periods that we choose to look at at a point in time. Um, Kian, I don't know if I've made that more confusing than it needed to be because I tend to do that. Um, Maybe just one, just one thing I would add is that obviously we're very conscious of the risks, shall we say, of any quantitative framework mm -hmm. are that it works for a certain period of time. It works in sample, if you like, and doesn't necessarily work outside of that sample. So flexibility is important, as Joe has said, the ability to look at different time periods and look at, at different lags between the inputs. So we are quite flexible. We're not wedded to one particular model or one particular framework because you see over time, these relationships do change. So big picture, the impact of money supply growth, for example, on inflation has, has changed over time as economies become more, more developed, more sophisticated. <laughs> The US being the obvious example, that relationship has changed. It tends to be stronger, interestingly, in, in less developed economies where the financial system isn't as complex. You get a, a neater relationship there. Similarly with oil, we've seen over recent, over decades, that relationship has changed. The global economy today is, is less sensitive to a change in oil price than it was in the 1970s. So you, ne you need to constantly consider the appropriateness of your model. And we, we do that by constantly looking at, at different time periods, at, at different iterations. It's not a hard and fast, purely black box approach. I think that's an important point to make. So to your point about the US, for instance, where the financial markets had become increasingly more sophisticated, you know, and looking at broad money supply was not that um, was not that uh, strong as an expansionary power. We actually dissect the components of the money supply to try to decipher which of those components could be used for transaction purposes. And that is the breakdown that we would use within our models rather than broad money supply, because that's where we get more of an explanatory power within our models. So, you know, there are some, um, there are some nuances in terms of the data um, that we do, and it's constantly being revised um, and constantly being checked. You know, for instance, if you look at Turkey, looking at broad Turkish money supply, I mean, the, the impact of the exchange rate was huge. So we had to create a, a lira denominated only um, money supply um, a data series to use within our analysis. Um, so yeah, so. It's, it's okay. Uh, here we have another, we have two or three more questions. Um, this question is related to uh, real nominal rates and effects. Uh, in your investment process, after forecasting uh, rates, uh, how do you take the decision considering the, the, that we have seen huge move, movement in, in currencies? So, um, Kian, I'll start again and uh, just let me know if I've missed anything. I guess if we're going into a little bit of our investment process, I should say that our analysis of bonds and currencies are completely separate. We look at the real yield in the bond market and completely detach 
from the currency valuation for which we use the real exchange rates. We optimize and build our bond portfolio completely separate to the currency portfolio, but then within the final stages of portfolio construction, you know, when we marry up the two, we then assess the risks in the portfolio as a whole. But in terms of um, a currency move driving our view on the bond market, that doesn't exist for us. The, the only thing I would add to that is that having generated a real yield estimate, that does play a role in our currency valuation process. In other words, mm -hmm. there is a, a pull factor of a high real interest rate in terms of the exchange rate. You would expect capital to flow towards those economies with higher real yields or higher real interest rates. And therefore that to act as something of a, of a positive impetus to the exchange rates in those economies. So we forecast inflation, we derive a real yield, but that real yield can impact on our currency valuation as well. It's part of the currency valuation, if that makes sense. Okay, here, um, here we have the last question. Um, regarding the accuracy uh, of your forecast, do you use only lag variables or you also consider a scenario analysis uh, when you uh, work with your models. Ken, would you like to start with that one? Let me, let me pick that up and say very briefly, really, we aim to use lagged variables only. So like any modeling framework, there, 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 there can be a trade-off between um, between accuracy and, and the availability, if you like, of data inputs. So for us, we want to keep the quantitative modeling as simple as possible using only <laughs> realized, and therefore lagged variables. Scenario analysis, therefore, doesn't come into it. We do have that qualitative assessment that comes after the quantitative one. So there, there is the ability to adjust the model output, but we, we don't go as far as scenario analysis because ultimately I think that would, that would dilute the impact of what we're doing. So if you have a model, but then you decide to just override that with, let's say, your forecast of the oil price, then you're no longer forecasting inflation, really. You're, just, you're forecasting the oil price. And your inflation forecast then becomes a function of the accuracy of your oil price forecast. Whereas by definition, we don't believe that we have a particular edge in forecasting the oil price. So what we're trying to do is, is forecast the inflation rate using lagged variables to reduce as much as possible the, the uncertainty from forecasting other variables as well. Anything else, Joe? Yeah, I mean, I would, yeah, I would, um, I would stick with that. Yeah. Otherwise I might just get a little bit more <laughs> confusing in my answer. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, uh, in very interesting topic. Uh, I would like to say thanks to Kian and Joanna for this uh, interesting presentation. Uh, finally, we would like to thank to our sponsors, FinSA, Moneda Asset Management, Scotiabank, Sarton, and Janus Henderson. Uh, thanks everybody for attending this webinar and we hope to see you in the next CFA Society Chile event. Thank, Thank you, you Joanna and Kian. Thank you.